Maybe you're in a valley right now. It can feel lonely, dark, and cold. You feel forgotten, forsaken, and empty. You cry out and you ask why, but in the valley, you're hidden in the shadow of a cross placed high on a hill. So look to a savior that took on your pain. He bore the weight of your mistakes and your shortcomings. He was forsaken so you could be chosen. He was bound so you could be free. He died so you could live. It's quite poetic that your new beginning starts with, it is finished. He conquered death, he can conquer your circumstance. It is finished. He suffered and endured so victory could be yours. It is finished. So lift your eyes up to the hill. Help is on the way. It is finished. Walk through this valley with no fear and follow your triumphant king. It is finished. See, the valley is for now, but his kingdom is forever. Hey, what's up, church? Listen, I got to tell you, man, I'm incredibly excited about Easter Adventure this year. I promise you, listen, it is an experience that you do not want to miss. I know it's going to be a little bit different this year, okay? I, I feel pretty certain in saying that it's going to be an Easter experience like, like you've never experienced, like I've never experienced. But listen, it's not going to be a bad thing, right? Because here's what Easter is going to look like. Easter this year is going to look like hundreds of thousands of people worshiping across countless neighborhoods and countless communities in, in all the states, all across our nation. It's going to look like people proclaiming the name of the one true God over their neighborhoods, over their streets, over their neighbors. It's going to look like a body of believers that the enemy thought had pushed us back into the recesses of the darkness. It pushed us back into the corner. But in reality, it's going to look like a body of believers that's taken the gospel out like it's never been taken out before. It's going to look like a people that's been given the greatest platform we could have ever been given. And so listen, you don't want to miss this experience, I promise. Invite your friends, invite your family. Maybe you can't invite them to come hang out with you at your house, but you still can invite them to worship with you, man. Invite them to join us online.venturechurch.org. They can get all the information there on our website. It's going to be absolutely incredible. So make sure you're part of it. Make sure, man, you're inviting somebody else to worship with us. Now, today... We're going to be diving into uh, week two of our series, The Prayers of Jesus, as we get ready for that Easter experience, right? As we kind of prepare our hearts and prepare our minds for what God's going to do in that experience, we've been talking about the different uh, sayings, the different words, the different prayers that, that Jesus uses as he hangs on the cross. And listen, i got to tell you, I, I'm really excited about this series. One of the reasons I'm really excited about this series is because we see in this moment, right, we see when, when we look at... These few moments that Jesus has on the cross and the few statements we're able to glean from that moment. I mean, we get a picture of Jesus unlike any other because we get a, an unfiltered picture of Jesus. Now, here's what I mean by that. Because I'm not saying that any other time we get a, a fake picture of Jesus or a filtered picture of Jesus. But we know in our lives what that looks like, right? We know what it means to put a filter on because we do it all the time, right? I mean, we, we have developed this habit, and it might even be by necessity, to, to kind of put on this, this image, to put on this mask, to put on this filter, to, to be who we think we need to be or to be who we think the world around us wants us to be in any given moment. But you know, there are a couple of things in life that can remove that filter in a blink of an eye, right? Sorrow and grief, that's one of those things, kind of anxiety and, and fear, that's one of those things that can move that filter in just a moment. But another one of those, those feelings, another one of those emotions is pain. Or you know what I'm talking about? Pain can, can it'll take your filter off in, in just a blink of an eye. Like the, the classic example, right? You know this. The classic example, you take a hammer, you're nailing something, you accidentally hit your thumb. What happens? You're going to yell something. You're going to say something in that moment that you might not necessarily yell in the, the aisle. Okay, maybe Walmart's a bad example, but somewhere else in public, right? Ladies, you, you know, like in, in the labor and delivery room, right? The, normally, you might care what that doctor, what that nurse thinks about you. But in that moment, in that pain, right, in that feeling, you don't care anymore. 
the filter comes off. And so in this moment, when we look at Jesus on the cross, we're seeing a very real man and very real pain, right? Scripture tells us that, that Jesus was fully God and he was fully man. That he was God wrapped in the realness of humanity. And so when we see Jesus on the cross, he's a, he's a very real man with very real feelings. And here's a man who is experiencing very real pain. Here's a man who's been beaten. Beaten within inches of his life. Here's a man who, who's been mocked, who's been ridiculed. He's, he's taken nails through his hands and he's taken nails through his feet. And he's, he's been hung up. And he, here's a man who, who the whole weight of his body is just weighing down on his sternum, who's having to, to lift himself up off of his own wounds just to, just to catch a breath. And in this moment, man, in pain that like we could never imagine, the filter's off. And so in this moment, we get to see like what, what's really on his mind, what he's really thinking about, what really matters the most when everything else is stripped away. And what we see is in this moment, the thing that mattered the most to him was you. And it was me. It was, it was our experience, not only with one another, with, with his body of believers, but it was our experience with, with our Heavenly Father, with his Father. I mean, we see a God who, in his humanity, is showing us care, and is showing us love, and is showing us grace, and is showing us mercy. I want to show you man, to what, what I think is one of the most powerful statements of the crosses. In Luke uh, chapter 23 is where we're going to be looking. Luke chapter 23. We're going to start in verse 32. And now listen, while you're going there, while you're, you're either opening up your app, turning to your Bible, if you like to take notes, you're opening up your, your um, note app, whatever it is you're doing. Man, I just want to say right here for, for just a quick moment, man, I, I think that, that you deserve some celebration. Right, that I think that you deserve some celebration for your, your passion and your energy and your boldness and your, and your courage and your creativity. And, and then a very unsettling season, an unsettling time. Because, you know, this has been a season over the past several weeks that, that, that we never saw coming. I mean, let's be honest. A month ago, we, we never would have thought we were sitting in, we would be sitting in the circumstances we're sitting in now. But here we are. And this could have been a season that broke your faith. It could have been a season that broke your trust in the church or your trust in God. It could have been a season that, that just broke you. But instead, what we've seen over the past several weeks, man, we've seen you going out with, with incredible tenacity into the neighborhoods, man, and loving your neighbors well. We, we've seen people serving. We've seen people loving on our schools and, and food banks and making sure that nobody's going lonely, nobody's going hungry, and nobody feels broke. And we, we've seen you just loving in incredible ways. And so, listen, I want to celebrate that. But at the same time, I know that not everybody's having that same experience. Because I know, and there are a lot of people watching today, that, that this season, it has pushed you to that breaking point. And this season, man, it, it has pushed you right to the edge and maybe even over the edge. And this has kind of been a season where you don't know if there's any trust in God because that question has been welling up inside of you. And I think we all get this question of where is God in all of this? Man, I mean, in all of the circumstances and all of the and all the pain and all the sorrow and all the, the uneasiness, like where is where's God in all of this? And listen, I, I don't want to, to shy away from that question. I want to answer that question. I want to lean into that question with, with Jesus on the cross and what he tells us here in Luke chapter 23. If you start in verse 32, and so kind of the scene here that we're going to pick up is Jesus at this point has already been arrested. He's already been tried. He's already heard the words guilty. He's heard his punishment. He knows that, that the cross is coming. And so verse 32, Luke tells us that two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him, with Jesus. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Okay, now, now hang with me right here for just a second because these two verses kind of set the whole scene for everything we're going to talk about today. Because what we have in this story is we have three people, right? Now, now Luke tells us that there was Jesus and there was two criminals. But for the, the Romans here, for the ones who have arrested these men, for the, the ones who are, who, are, are, who are carrying out this execution, there's not Jesus plus two criminals, there's three criminals. 
right? There, there's three men who have been tried, and there's three men who have been found guilty, and there's three men who are being led away to execution. You know, we always have this picture when we think about Easter and we think about the scene of the crucifixion, right? There's one cross that stands in the middle and it's taller and it's wider and the lights are shining up on it. And that's where Jesus was, right? And it's this special high and lifted up place. And then there's two smaller ones kind of sitting in the darkness. That's not the true picture. The true picture is there was three equal crosses. Because in the eyes of the Romans there, there was three equal criminals, It's not that Jesus was lifted up even in this moment, but Jesus was brought to the lowest of lows. He was put on equal ground with the lowest people of that time. There are three people here who who are going through the exact same circumstances, right? I want you to understand this. There are three people who've been beaten. There's three men who've been mocked. There's three men who have been ridiculed. There's three men who are being laughed at in this moment. There's three men whose clothes have been stripped away from them. There's three men who have been found guilty and are headed to their execution. There are three men who have had to carry the the instrument of their death to the place in which they would be executed. There's three men in the exact same circumstances. And there's three men that have very different experiences in the end because, and this is what I want you to see, because they have very different perspectives. See, this is the idea I want you to hang on to today, okay? This is the idea that's going to shape everything else we see in this passage, and it is that perspective, not circumstance, will ultimately shape your experience. Let me say it again. Perspective, not circumstance, is what will ultimately shape your experience. We can experience, we can have the same circumstances, but we will ultimately have a different experience in the end based off of our perspective. And this is why I want you to hang on to this, okay? This is why I think this is so important. Because you can ultimately, and I can ultimately, influence our perspective. But we can't always change our circumstance, right? We can't always influence, we can't always affect our circumstance, but we can influence, we can change our perspective. See, you can't change everything that's going on in the world around you. You can't change what the government's saying. You can't change the recommendations from the CDC. You can't change how annoying your kids are right now. You you can't change all of those circumstances, but you can choose to have a different perspective. Let me give you a very simple example, okay? Right now, There are tens of thousands of people who are watching this word on different social media platforms. These are the same social media platforms that just weeks ago, that just days ago, were an instrument of the enemy, were an instrument of of Satan himself who was pushing different images, false images of what it looked like to be a man, what it looked like to be a woman, who was pushing images of negativity and hate. Man, this is, this is the same social media platforms that, that the enemy had a hold on just days, just weeks ago. And now today, there are hundreds of thousands of people who are worshiping the name of God on these same platforms. You see, I could sit back, you could sit back, and we could choose to say, man, look at all of these things that this virus has taken away from us. Or in the midst of these same circumstances, we could sit back and we can say, look how much God is redeeming. And this time that the enemy thought he was going to break us. Look what, look what God is doing. See, a different perspective, same circumstance, but ultimately very different experiences. And so I want to show you kind of the different perspectives that, that all three of these men have and how it leads to a different experience. And so if you go down to verse 39 of Luke chapter 23, it says, One of the criminals who were hanging railed at him or yelled at him or mocked him being Jesus, saying, are you not the Christ? Are you not the one sent from God? Are you not the promised one? Save yourself and, this is important, and, hey, save us. right? Because here's what he's saying. Hey, listen, man, you're saying you're the son of God. Hey, listen, you're saying, your followers are saying you can do all these miracles. Well, hey, but it's, it's time to do that, right? Because, listen, I'm hurting. That's what he's saying, right? But listen, this isn't, this isn't fun. I'm in pain here. And Jesus, you're saying you're so good. Well, come on, show that to me. Now listen, I, that's not a bad thing to say. right? Because we get this. I mean, we understand this. We, this is our default, is it not? I mean, when we go through circumstances that we don't like, what happens? Our immediate thing is to pray that God will change those circumstances, right? I mean, I think that's natural, and I don't think that's bad. I think God is, is a good father who wants us to, to lay our troubles and lay our complaints bare before him at the cross. Like, he cares to hear that from us. 
But we have to be careful in these moments because if we focus in on just what we're experiencing, if we focus in on just our circumstances, we'll miss what God is doing in us, through us, in the midst of these circumstances. This guy had no idea that this was a son of God before him that could have radically changed his eternal experience. But he missed all of that because he was focused on his temporary experience. And so listen, in the midst of your temporary experiences, I just don't want you to miss what God is doing in you, and what God wants to do through you. And so can I just challenge you, man, in this season, as look, you're praying that God's going to do something special, and you're praying that God's going to work miracles, and God's going to change the circumstances, and listen, we're joining in with you in that prayer. But listen, in that prayer, can I just challenge you to also pray that that God will show you what he wants to grow in you, that God will show you how he wants to change you in this season, that God will show you how he wants to use you in this season. I just don't want you to miss what God is wanting to do in and through you because you're distracted by your temporary circumstances. They're just that temporary. There is something greater coming, and that's ultimately the point of this text. You keep going in this story. Verse 40, it says, But the other, that being the other criminal, the other criminal rebuked him, rebuked the first one. Hey, man, what are you doing? He says, Listen, do you not fear God? Because you are under the same sentence of condemnation. He says, and we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. So he's saying, listen, why are you yelling at him? Why are you mocking him? Because look, he doesn't deserve to be here. We do. Right? Like we, we have been found guilty because we've done something wrong. He's not done anything wrong. And so then he looks at Jesus, verse 42. He looks at Jesus and says, remember me. When you come into your kingdom. And so in that moment, he recognizes Jesus as the one true king, right? Not only does he recognize who he is, being a sinner, being broken, being found guilty, but he also recognizes who Jesus is. And we'll see in just one moment, the very next verse tells us that, hey, this guy ends up with a totally different experience in the midst of the same circumstances. The end result is completely different for him. Because in the midst of his circumstances, he chose to focus in on something different. See, the first criminal, all he saw was himself, right? The main difference here between these two guys is that one just saw himself, and the other saw himself in light of who God is. He said, listen, I'm broken, and I'm a sinner, and I deserve to be here. But he's God, and he's full of grace, and he's full of mercy, and he's full of love, and He doesn't deserve to be here because he's the one true king. And so in this moment, not only does he he, he find the true picture of himself, but he finds a true picture of God. And so there's just two very simple things here, right? Two very simple ideas to kind of help flip your perspective if you want to have a different perspective in the midst of your circumstances. Because, again, you can't always control your circumstances, but you can influence, you can control your perspective. And so if you want to begin to flip that perspective, two very simple ideas. One, acknowledge who you are. And then acknowledge who he is. Because we're all broken. We can all join in with the words of this criminal. Hey, I deserve this punishment. Man, I deserve pain. Because I, I've, man, I've turned my back on God. I, I've rejected him. I, I've lived against what he's called me to live for. Like, I deserve it. But he, but God, man, he's full of grace. And he's full of mercy. He's the one true king. He's the true savior. And I'm nothing ultimately without him. And man, if we can key in on that, right? If we can see ourselves in light of who he is, well, then all of a sudden, all of our prayers for God to change our circumstances, well, then those prayers begin to sound a lot different. Because it's not just about me experiencing something better, but it's about me experiencing him in the midst of where I am. Now, that's the two criminals. But what about Jesus? Because like I said, those two guys, like they deserve to be there. But what does Jesus say in this moment? Well, if you look at verse 43, it says, And Jesus said to him, and I want you to hear this promise, not just in the lives of these criminals. I I want you to hear this promise, not just as something recorded in a book. I want you to hear this promise spoken over you, spoken over your life, spoken over your family, over your circumstances, over the future God has called you to. He says, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. 
That's such a sweet word right there, paradise. You know, I was talking with a guy several weeks ago in the atrium at our Lincoln Road campus, and we were talking about this verse. I don't even remember how we got on this verse. I don't even remember how we, why in the world we were talking about this, but I remember we were talking about this one phrase, and this guy says, you know, I think, I think Jesus used the word paradise there because it's really the only word our mind could comprehend with what he's talking about. He said, you know, because we can't really comprehend just how great it is, the promise that he's given us in this moment. Like we can't comprehend, our minds can't, can't wrap around how incredible the promise of eternity is with him. But, but our minds get the word paradise. Our minds get the word that paradise means something that we don't deserve, right? Something far better than we deserve. And I think he's right. I think that's what, what Jesus is saying here. Listen, today you'll be with me in paradise that there's a promise of something far greater than we could ever imagine coming. Man, I, I think about uh, Timmy Runke's message a couple of weeks ago. I think it was week six of our peace series. He was talking about, man, the season where he was dealing with the death of his mom. And he said the, the hope of a better day is what kept him moving forward, right? The hope of something better coming was, was the, the idea that kept him moving that kept him going is this hope that, that there's paradise coming, right? That there's, that, that there's a better day coming, that God's prepared a place for us where there's no more sorrow, where there's no more weeping, where there's no more pain, there's, there's no more grief, there's no more heartache, there's, there's no more cancer, there's no more virus, there's no more sickness, there's, man, there's no more lost loved ones. It's just paradise, it's just joy, it's just grace, it's just mercy. It's just a heavenly Father that loves us far more than we could ever deserve. He's gone and prepared that place for us. I love that idea, right? Jesus, Jesus told his disciples that he was going away to prepare a place for us, that in, his, that in his father's house there was many rooms. And I think about, you know, when someone comes over to my house, I, I want to prepare a place for them, right? Like I, I make sure they have a warm place to, to sleep and I make sure there's, there's towels that they can use and I make sure they, there's food that they can, well, I guess I don't, but my wife does because she, she's that caring kind of person, right? She cares about them and about their experience. And God says, listen, I'm going to prepare a place for you because I care about you. But it's a place far greater than, than a spare bedroom in our house, right? It's paradise. It's paradise with him. And listen, don't miss the fact that he is, he is giving this promise to a thief on a cross. And listen, when we say thief, like, like we're not just talking about someone who stole something from, from a gas station. Man, we're talking about a criminal who has been tried, who has been found guilty and worthy of execution, of worthy of death. I mean, this is the guy who has broken everything he could have broken. He's broken all the laws. He's been laid low. This is the, the lowest of society. And Jesus is looking at this guy when he literally has nothing else to offer him. Understand, this guy on the cross has absolutely nothing to offer to Jesus in this moment. And yet Jesus says, hey, you're going to come with me to paradise. I'm going to give you something greater than you could have ever fathomed. And so listen, I don't care what story you've lived up to this point. I mean, I don't care what brokenness you've walked through. I don't care what, man, the, the, the things you've done, the lies you've told. It doesn't matter. And it doesn't matter what you have to offer to Jesus because you know what? It can never, it can never repay him anyways. The promise still stands for you. He says, I got paradise waiting. And I got paradise I want to give you. This world, man, this world is so broken. Sin has broken this world that he created for us. But he said, I got a place where all of that has gone away. And man, I'm ready to give that to you. Today, you will be with me in paradise. You know, I don't think it's, <clears throat> I don't think it's because Jesus knew that this man would die that day that he said today. I, mean, I do think Jesus knew that, but... I think the promise, ultimately, what, what Jesus is telling this man is that he's not going to live another day without him. That he's not going to have to experience one more day without the promise, without the hope, without the goodness of God in a blink of an eye. Jesus says, I got it for you today. The promise is today. The promise is right now. You don't have to wait till tomorrow. You don't have to wait till the situation gets better. You don't have to wait till the circumstances change. You might have to wait till the government says something before you can get out of your house. But listen, you don't have to wait till your life gets better to experience Jesus. He says today, right now, right now, there's a promise of a far better life for you laid out because of the cross. He says today, you will be with me 
in paradise. You know, I, <laughs> paradise is the word we like to talk the most about, right? Because it sounds good. It's, it's sweet to our ears. We love it. Today is, is such a powerful thought because, man, here's a, here's a guy who, who couldn't change his circumstance, and yet, and yet Jesus is saying, I, I got the gift for you today, but ultimately I don't think it's paradise. That's the ultimate promise, or that's the ultimate point of this promise, and I don't even think it's today. I think it's this idea. He says, today you will be with me. It's a way of saying that is, is I don't think paradise is the pinnacle of this promise. I think the presence of Jesus is the pinnacle of this promise. That ultimately, the thing that Jesus is promising this guy above all else is his presence. It's his, it is his presence that ultimately means paradise, right? It's not that paradise is this brand new place. It's not that paradise is, hey, I'm going to take you away from everything else. But Jesus says, hey, paradise is that I'm with you and you're with me. That you don't have to walk any other place alone. That you don't have to experience any other situation in life alone. Today, I'm with you. I want you to hear this promise, man. Today, he is with you. And you can be with him. It's a promise that's all throughout his word, right? That, that, that he is with us. That we don't have to walk this life alone. That He, he told his disciples, hey, it's good that I go away because when I go away, I'm going to send my spirit. I'm going to send the presence of God to live with you, to dwell with you, right? That you don't have to, to live in this life alone anymore, but the presence of God is going to literally live with you. The word of God tells us that that man, when we draw near to God, he draws near to us, right? The word of God tells us that, that he is near the brokenhearted. It tells us that where two or three are gathered, there he is also. I want you to hear this promise. God is with you. That you don't have to experience this valley alone and you don't have to experience this mountain alone. You don't have to experience the pain, the sorrow, the grief alone. God is with you. And so when we look at our circumstances and we wonder, where is God in all of this? Listen, the answer is, he's with you. He's with you and he's with me. He hasn't left us. He hasn't forsaken us. He's with us in the midst of this. No, this isn't the perfect world. Sin broke the world God created for us. And there's a greater day coming. But in the journey there, we're not journeying alone. He's with us. Listen, I believe that the ultimate joy of heaven and of earth is Jesus. That we experience his joy in every moment. In every day. There's this quote I, I want to leave you with. <clears throat> it's from a, an author named John Elderidge, and he says this. He says, when we hear the words eternal life, most of us tend to interpret that as a life that waits for us in eternity. But, this is important, but e eternal, eternal means unending, not later. And so he says the offer the offer from Jesus on the cross, the offer, the offer is life. And that life starts now. Right now, today, the offer is given to you that God says, I want to live this life with you. I want to walk this life with you. Your pain, your sorrow, your grief, your joys, your celebrations, I want to live it with you. I don't want you to experience this alone. God says, I'm with you in it. And it's his presence in us that ultimately allows us to experience paradise. It's his presence in us that when we look at the circumstances and we look at the brokenness of our world, man, we can still proclaim him and we can still worship him and we can still sing with all that we have that, God, it is well within my soul because, God, even when the circumstances aren't great, God, you are because he's with us and he hasn't left us alone. And so listen, I, I'm going to pray and then we're going to, man, we're going to worship him with all that we have because, listen, he's here. In your living room, he's there. With you and your family right now, he's there. With you alone, watching on your phone in your car, he's there. He's with us. His presence is here in this place. And man, we can worship him regardless of what the circumstances look like. But right now in this moment, I do want you to know that if you're ready, man, like the thief on the cross, hey, today's the day. You need to take that first step into his presence. You need to take that first step into his presence in your life. Listen, there's going to be some links dropped in the, the, um, <clears throat> the chat there where, you, where you're watching right now. And you can respond through our online communication card. One of our pastors will reach out to you. We want to help you take that step. More than anything else, listen, I just want you to know 
whatever circumstance, whatever situation, in whatever valley, whatever mountain, you're not alone in it. God's with you. Let's pray. God, we praise you. We honor you. Lord, we celebrate you. Because God, you're here. You're with us. And we're not alone. God, and we rest in your presence today. When we can't rest in anything else, when we can't rest because it feels like there's, there's chaos and, and there's uncertainty and everything wrong around us, God, you're with us. And so, God, we rest in you, we praise you, and we celebrate you. And I pray that you will be glorified, that you will be honored in us. All things we ask in your name.